thank you very much for inviting me today. It's um, a really interesting experience for me to meet some like-minded people because it can be quite lonely as a cardiologist with an interest in um, holistic approaches to things. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I've been a consultant cardiologist since 94. I was appointed in 94. I did a lot of my junior doctor training in this region. I um, did my house jobs in Swindon, and then I moved and did a year of A&E at Frenchay Hospital, which was here then. Uh, did an SHO rotation at the BRI, and then did um, registrar and senior registrar posts in Bath before moving to Poole, where I was a consultant cardiologist until the end of last year. Um, I also worked as a community cardiologist in Wimborne and Blandford hospitals, uh, and I'm currently working at the Royal Bournemouth Hospital Trust. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that. So, you know, why does somebody suddenly not be a full-time cardiologist uh, at this point in their career? Um, for the medical students among you, I've got Erlis Danlos, and I suddenly lost quite a lot of my eyesight in a very sh short time. So whereas I was a fully practicing cardiologist doing procedures, angiography, pacing, without good binocular vision, that's quite difficult. So I electively decided that I wanted to stop doing procedures before I was told to stop doing them. Um, I'd had a pretty good safety record up until that point. And also, I, it made me rethink things as well because I thought, well, hey, if I can't see as good as I want to see, I'm not going to sit there thinking, I wish I'd seen another infarct. I'm going to say, hey, I wish I'd been riding my horse or walking my dog. So it does make you rethink your, your life. And also, there were certain areas of cardiology that I felt were neglected, and I really then had the time to sort of set up some new services. And so I went on, as soon as I, three years now since I've done any invasive procedures, I went on to set up a syncope service and atrial fibrillation flutter rhythm disturbance um, service. So just a little bit about Right. Is that, Pool that is Pool Harbour. That was the view from actually from our coronary care, because I had a particular interest in coronary care. And so I think used to think that was a really good I can manage just with this. Yes, sure. um, that it was really a healing thing for the patients to look out and see that view. So yeah, we had an eight-bedded unit, in fact we've still got it, but interestingly, and I'm sure it's the same in, in Bristol as well, that because of primary PCI, the patients don't spend so much time in hospital and actually Maybe later on I'll tell you a slightly funny story that happened to me last week that sort of actually sort of um, illustrates that perhaps pa patients are taken in and, and allowed out so quickly now that they don't, don't get time to accommodate their diagnosis. Um, I was exposed to integrated medicine as a child. Um, my grandmother was um, a spiritualist and a medium and a herbalist, and so I can't remember taking anything. Um, normal, let's say, as a child. I was given sulfur tablets and marshmallow and slippery ale ointment was rubbed on my chillblains and things like that. I thought all that was normal. So, you know, when I went to uh, medical school, I suddenly thought, hey, no, this isn't normal. And of course, um, and, I th and I actually at that time felt quite embarrassed about all of that. And so it's, it's slightly strange that in a way I've come full circle now. Um, but actually, throughout my consultant career, I have, quite soon on, I recognised that I just didn't have the answers, I didn't have the treatments. In my armamentum of, of drugs and um, treatments I could offer, offer patients, and I did, I would say within a couple of years of, of being a consultant cardiologist, I'd already referred people to things like healers um, and homeopaths and chiropractors because I just didn't have the answer. So th there is a bit of a sort of adverse image of cardiologists at the moment as being a type A person sort of strutting their stuff around. And as I was saying to Liz earlier, I think that is a little bit unfair because most of the cardiologists, and I now work at Bournemouth where it's a big invasive cardiology centre, 
they're actually, they're all really lovely, but they just don't have the time to give patients to talk to them. I remember when I was pacing, I was terrified of the patients feeling pain, so I used to like, give them a big slug of midazolam, um, not because I didn't want to talk to them, but actually, if you were in a rush, it was easier if the patient didn't talk to you during the procedure. You know, you just wanted to sort of get on with it. So I think that's what's happening with them, but it isn't that they don't want to, they just really don't have the time. And also, it's quite sexy doing procedures and stenting and things like that. And it's, I think it's very sort of sexy to junior doctors when you try to talk to them about taking time and taking histories and um, lifestyle measures. It seems quite dull and boring, but actually, believe you me, it's, it's not. So, I'm going the wrong way. All right, so... Um, Thinking about rhythm disturbance, I've tried to simplify it. Obviously, rhythm disturbance, there's lots of different um, rhythm disturbances, but the most ones that you're going to see, particularly as a general practice, are going to be ectopic beats. <coughs> I've got a few myself at the moment, actually. Um, <laughs> atrial fibrillation or flutter. Um, flutter's much, much more unusual, and it's managed completely differently. Um, but there is an awful lot of autonomic dysfunction going about. One in 500 people have this, and it's really under-recognized, and I could work all, all week just doing that. Um, that's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, vasovagal syncope. It's been increasingly recognized that these are common. They have you know, quite a lot of... Um, they cause untold problems for the patients with driving and things like that, and they're probably under-recognised. So I'm mainly sort of focusing on these, and I'm also giving you real examples of patients that I've dealt with over the last years. I can say things like the names have been removed to protect the innocent type of thing. Um, so how do I go about it? You know, what do I do in my working week as a cardiologist with rhythm disturbance? So I've Having, having said, I've moved to, to um, the Royal Bournemouth Trust and I'm doing two days a week there. I have been working on mainly heart failure and general cardiology for them, but their new heart failure consultants arrived, so I'm going back to rhythm disturbance. And so I may see um, six new patients in a, an AF clinic. Each would have half an hour. But if I'm seeing a patient with syncope, I would give them an hour because that's what you need to take the full history. You might need to take the history from a witness. So the history in my line of work is really important. I think it, it's important for everybody, but if someone's presenting with an infarct, it's slightly different to rhythm disturbance. So rhythm disturbance, you really need to focus down and um, you know, ask lots of questions. And the examination, yes, it's important. It's great if they have their rhythm disturbance when you examine them, but actually that is really rare. Um, you know, I can count, probably count on one hand the number of times that's happened to me, and I, you know, I've seen countless patients over the years. Uh, and also the symptoms are really short-lived, and people describe them very, very differently, like butterflies in my chest, you know, water dribbling in my chest, um, you know, we're taught to sort of get them to tap it out. Patients, for some reason, they don't seem to like doing it. I might tap out ectopic beats to them and I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly it. But they, they're quite unconfident about, about doing that. So I do approach it in a sort of orthodox manner, but probably ask quite different questions to a lot of my colleagues. But I still use the same baseline investigations as any other cardiologist. So yes, I want my 12 lead ECG and ECG monitoring is the key. And we have lots of different tools now. Um, it's a 24 hour ECG, which is what most GPs ask for when they refer someone to my clinic, is um, to quote a sort of Northern expression, neither use nor ornament really. Um, you're very lucky if you actually find anything on it. The only thing I would ask for one of those for would be a patient with AF. I've changed their medication and I want to see what their rate control is like. So I wouldn't really bother with that. What you really want is a seven-day ECG and they've got different sort of titles. There's a thing called a Novacore but the problem with a Novacore is it's very different when difficult when you analyze it to see the start and the end of the rhythm disturbance and that's what we really want to know. Did it start with an ectopic beat or something like that? So seven-day ECG, go for that. You know, there's also um, an instant check, which I describe as like a Nintendo DS, where you put your thumbs on it, 
and it captures um, the rhythm disturbance. And they have the patients are allowed sort of six goes with that. But there's this alive core now, which goes with the iPhone, so that's even better. It does a 12 lead ECG. There's even these things called implantable loop recorders, which are about the size of, size of my little finger, which are sort of put in here. But they have to be put in in theatre. And actually, there's injectable ones now, but they're quite expensive, about two grand. So they're usually only being used in private practice, but they can be put in in the clinic. Um, quite recently, I went to scan some dogs because I've got deer hands and they get cardiomyopathy. And I was scanning these dogs with the veterinary cardiologist and I told her about these injectable loop recorders and she said, pet plan, we'll pay for them. So um, you may find that um, we get a paper out of that. Um, yes, I like them to have... I do a lot of um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and there's some great gadgets sort of on the market at the moment that are really not expensive where the patients can check their blood pressure at home for seven days and the same gadget picks up if they've had rhythm disturbance AF. It's 120 pounds. It's sort of, I've no shares in it, by the way. Um, so I think... Um, if you leave me an email, I'll email it to you. It was at, it was at Heart Rhythm UK last week, and um, I thought, I've got to have some of those. Um, and trans thoracic echoes. I mean, how long do you wait here as a GP for a trans thoracic echo for one of your patients? Eons. Yeah. Eons. 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 Yeah, I mean, it... it I set up a sort of open access echo service in the community years ago, and it was like frozen for a while by the CCG, but most of the time we can get an echo within a couple of weeks. If, I mean, if they've got a raised BNP, brain natriuretic protein, protein they've got to, um, uh, peptide, they've got to have an echo within two weeks. But, you know, even as a cardiologist, I have to wait quite a long time sometimes. But for rhythm disturbance clinics, particularly AF and Flutter, they have a, an echo on the day they come to clinic. So they'll have had an ECG, they've usually had some monitoring, and they'll have had an echo before I see them. So yeah, I am doing all of those things. And the patients expect that. They know, know all about these. Uh, I keep going the wrong way, sorry. No. So... In the history, you know, what kind of things are you going to ask? I really want to know, why is this patient presenting to, be, to me now? I mean, I get a lot of patients, like everybody does, who, who may come back after years and years. And I don't think we focus enough on giving them time to sort of talk about their problems. And it was interesting that, you know, the new, the new consultant started in the heart failure clinic. And... The nurse uh, rang me yesterday and said, oh, you know, they'd only just opened their mouths and immediately he was interrupting them. And I was like, mm, well, he's got a lot to learn, but I'm sure he'll get there in the end. But you have to really say to the patients, you know, tell me about your rhythm disturbance. What is it like? When do you get it? And they're not, you, I, I don't think they're used to being asked these questions. They sort of seem to expect you to do all the talking for them. Um, and I think we should try and sort of change the mindset a little bit. When patients, I don't have a huge private practice, you know, now, I, I used to have quite a big one, but when they used to come privately, they, they want to talk forever about it. So there is a sort of difference there. Um, so I'm asking why have they got these symptoms at this time? When do they occur? A lot of rhythm disturbance people describe is just after they've got into bed at night time. That's really common. So you can ask about that. You know, one thing that's really important to know is, is it worse with exercise? Patients hardly ever say it's worse with exercise. If it is, that's a red flag. You know, there's something usually very wrong. Um, the other red flag, particularly for the medical students, is if it's associated with syncope or presyncope. That's really um, concerning. Uh, any trigger factors? Um, we'll talk about those a little bit more later, but is there any activities? Um, stresses that they can identify, foods. I mean, I've had patients over the years where they only ever got an SVT, you know, when they ate, a, you know, a madras. So um, that's quite easy to manage, you know. So you're not going to have an ablation just, you know, when you can just stop eating madras curries. <laughs> so, but some people will probably say they want the ablation as well. Um, so I, I take a food and drink diary. And that's really important. And I don't know any of my colleagues that do that. And how and when do I do it? When I'm standing them for 10 minutes to check their lying and standing blood pressures. So 
that's a really, really important thing to do, I think, with any sort of um, cardiac patient. And so when they're standing there at my mercy, I say to them, right, let's just, let's take a typical day. What time do you get up? What do you have for breakfast? And it's been a real eye-opener. So I take quite an extensive um, food and drink history. Obviously, I ask them about alcohol. And also, I spend a lot of time going through their family history. And it's great if they bring somebody with them. I used to sort of, when, in my early career, if there was lots of relatives there, I used to hate it. Now I love it because I can get so much more information. And I ask all my patients who they take after. And... Again, I think that's um, an unusual question. I don't know any of my colleagues that are doing that. Why do I ask that? Um, because a lot of the patients I see with autonomic problems, it's um, very genetic, often not so dominant. And actually, I could go on forever, but even things like mitral valve disease, mitral valve prolapse, aortic valve disease, a lot of it, you know, is genetic. Cardiomyopathy, when I first started as a consultant, we used to think this much was genetic. Now, most of it's genetic and it's triggered by some other event. So, it's really important, and it's amazing what comes out. People say, oh yeah, my, my dad had his mitral valve replaced when he was 70. You know, I've asked them their family history before and they've never mentioned it, but then I say, who do you take after? It suddenly sort of comes out the woodwork. So, you can't always rely on them. And there's some other relevant factors that I'll, I'll mention later. So, I do all the usual things on examination, but I always check oxygen saturations. It's so quick. Why not to do it? And also, that's really useful for doing the lying and standing heart rates. Um, I, I do standing for five minutes minimum. I like to do it for 10. And I also look at their skin, the patient's skin, any scars. Uh, and I do a quick musculoskeletal looking for um, connective tissue disorders because that's some... Um, you know, much more common than people realise. So I'll go through some cases. Um, this photograph got a bit squashed up because my, um, my wolf hand banged her sort of face onto the laptop and I was doing it and I couldn't, like, expand it after that. Um, so you're, showing, you're showing us the last slide. If you advance one. Oh, sorry, sorry. I moved on to the next one. That's it. Right, OK. okay. So yeah. quickly ask you about your lying and standing BP thing. Yeah. What I do is um, I have them sort of lying, and, and while I'm sort of examining everything, that's probably going to take at least five minutes, and then um, I will stand them up, and I'll check whether they can put their hands to the floor and do all kinds of contortionist things, which I can demonstrate, but I'd rather not. Um, and then I will check it at five minutes, and then I'll check it again at ten, you know, so... Um, and even if I'm allowing them an hour in clinic, so it's a syncope patient, it's amazing where the time goes. So I found if they do it for longer than 10, a lot of patients I might send for a tilt table test and then obviously they'll, they'll, they'll do it for much longer than that. And I do a lot more blood pressure monitoring, I think, than a lot of cardiologists do. So case number one, this lady, um, I met her, because I was a magistrate for a while, because um, I like to do lots of different things, and she was in my sort of like peer group for training. And it was interesting because she'd actually trained as a cardiac physiologist. So um, she came to see me early this year, and at this time she's working part-time as a magistrate and she's in family court. And family court goes on for days, so it's, you know, it'll be two or three days. And so I was saying, well, you know, is it still the same as it used to be where you don't get much time out and when you do, you just stuff your face with biscuits? And she said, yeah, it's very much like that. Uh, and she's hunched over the desk or the bench. And so it's quite, um, you know, obviously, it's, it's what's the word I'm looking for? She's, she's, not, she's not doing a lot of activity. Um, and what she'd noticed was that she was getting, well, she came in saying she's getting ectopic beats. She's got experience as a cardiac physiologist, so she knew what she was talking about. It was stopping her from getting to sleep at night. It wasn't waking her up. And she was really worried because they were going on a big family holiday to Florida and she thought she was going to ruin everybody's sort of holiday. Um, now, there's some history with this lady because um, whilst we were training, I saw her, she came in with... Um, it was a Saturday night, I can remember, uh, with an episode of pre-syncope 
and fast rhythm disturbance. And her ECG showed broad complex tachycardia um, with a certain pattern that was called a right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia. So it's coming from the pulmonary artery area. And you, you might hear this called normal heart VT. So I'm sure somebody must have died with it at some point if they were driving a car, but it's sort of a safe sort of VT, let's say. Um, she was obsessed with looking at her monitor. I mean, I actually went in to see her on the Saturday night because everybody was so worried about it, and I think she kind of made a big fuss because she's that sort of lady. Um, she'd been given some beta blockers by the admitting doctor. It had dropped her blood pressure. Um, and as we sort of do generally, we had to find out about her coronary arteries. You know, was it related to ischemia? She had a normal angiogram, and she went off and had an, EP, an electrophysiological study, and they couldn't, they couldn't provoke this rhythm disturbance. Sometimes you can find it if you're sort of messing about in the right ventricular outflow type, but it, they couldn't precipitate it. Um, and so we decided to start her on some of the nasty flecainide, and she was on it. Uh, she was actually on a small dose, 50 milligrams twice a day. I do use quite a lot of that at times. Um, and actually quite like it. And, <laughs> <laughs> dare I say. Um, but after 10 years, it was stopped by her GP. You know, I actually probably would have been felt a bit nervous at stopping, but it had been stopped. And so this kind of like came out um, in the history when I saw her. Um, she was a little bit hypertensive. She was a, quite a bit overweight. Her ECG was fine, did the tests. Um, on her seven-day ECG, uh, get that one up, um, she did have quite a lot of ectopic beats, couplets and triplets, but she did not have any sustained rhythm disturbance. And she certainly didn't have ventricular tachycardia. So I said, it's different to last time. You know, you haven't got it. And that's really what she wanted to know. She, you know, that's what she wanted to know. So I went heavy on the reassurance. I said, yes, you can go to Florida. Um, I sort of then, you know, said, I think you're a little bit overweight. I think you need to do more exercise. And she was describing some, like, reflux type of symptoms. And so I said, well, take a PPI, but I, I'm not a great believer in giving them forever. So I said, just, you know, for a month, I said, try probiotics. Her diet was not very good. And also, I have some success with giving magnesium supplements for this, and, and patients quite like to try that. And I normally give about 300 milligrams a day, and I gave her double dose because she was going to Florida, and we wanted to make absolutely certain. And I did give her a prescription of some very low-dose bisoprolol for PRN use. She didn't want to try it again after her adverse experience, but it was kind of like a safety blanket. And actually, when she went to Florida, she, did, she didn't use it. Can you talk about magnesium sulfate? That to stabilize? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on. So she's doing okay. Uh, this next guy was a recent retired GP from the Wimborne area. Oh, sorry. Is it the other way? Um, yeah. So, yeah, recently retired GP, and he came in complaining again of rhythm disturbance at night and after exercise. So not during the exercise. It was sh sort of in the, the next kind of like 10 minutes when he'd, when he'd stopped. So he was just 65. He didn't have any cardiovascular risk apart from the fact he was a bloke and he was 65. Um, his lipid profile, I didn't think, was too bad for somebody with no... Um, he didn't have a strong family history. His dad had died at 88 of an infarct. Um, he was a non-smoker, didn't drink much alcohol. And I asked him how he was spending his time. That's another question I like. You know, how do you spend your time? What are your hobbies? What are you doing with yourself? I mean, even if they're not, you know, not retired, I would, I would ask that, what they like doing in their spare time, because uh, I think that's very relevant. And he'd trained to be a forest ranger in the New Forest, so he was spending three or four days a week um, doing that, and it was really heavy work. When I examined him, he was painfully thin, I thought. Um, very underweight for his height. I think he was 10 and a half stone, and he was, he was actually over six foot. And his blood pressure, I felt, was on the low side of, of normal. Um, he had a normal ECG, had a normal echo. We did a seven-day ECG. When he had his symptoms, they were unifocal ventricular ectopics. His bloods were normal. And 
I decided we would do an exercise test on them. And exercise tests have kind of gone out of the window a bit because of CTCAs, but I find them really useful for a comfort blanket for the patients and confidence builder. And when he was on the treadmill, he did okay. He didn't get any symptoms until in recovery. And it, again, it was just unifocal ventricular ectopics. But his blood pressure hardly went up at all. Um, and the problem was really that he wasn't eating enough. He wasn't eating much. He was sort of terrified of getting heart disease because of his father. And, you know, he was skipping breakfast and... I, I felt he wasn't eating enough to keep a bird alive. And so I encouraged him to add some salt to his food. He certainly didn't want to go down the beta blockers or flecainide or anything like that. Um, he was going to think about magnesium supplements. And he's sort of one of those patients where you say, the door's always open, you can contact me. And he's actually doing fine. He's not got back to me. So. And he's, he's a local GP, so I'm sure I would know if there was a problem. So moving on to a really common rhythm disturbance which is atrial fibrillation. <laughs> so patients say, well, why have I got this? You know, what's going on? And I said, say to them, well, look, it's the electrics of your heart, the same way other things in the body get a bit furred up, like our joints and ligaments and stuff. This is like the heart going grey. So they sort of, they seem to relate to that. But the problem is, as a cardiologist, we've got very few drugs to give the patients. And so it's a little bit like... Me going to the hairdresser and saying, I'm going grey, and you go, right, we'll dye your hair black. You know, I don't want my hair dyed black. You know, it's not black. I want, I want it red or blonde or whatever. And so I feel it's like we see the patients that are going to treat you all the same. And not everybody's AF is the same. You know, lifestyle factors are really important. There's been a really big study out called the Legacy Study showing that, you know, even pre and post ablation, if you actually put the patients on a course of weight reduction, um, check them for sort of obstructive sleep apnea and talk to them, they actually, um, some of them didn't have ablations to start off with. They felt their symptoms were manageable. And certainly post ablation, that group did much better than the ones who were on drugs. So it's now being really big, you know, in, in heart rhythm that um, all these lifestyle factors. So weight, lack of exercise particularly, obstructive sleep apnea, blood pressure, alcohol. I'll be checking all of those things and obviously other cardiac sort of comorbidities. We all, you know, valve disease, all that type of stuff, yes, but you, can't, you have to think laterally now. Um, yes, I do the same tests uh, as most doctors will do. I want to know their thyroid function. I, as said, do a lot of seven-day ECGs for paroxysm, atrial fibrillation, flutter, um, only the 24-hour one for looking at rate control, and I like them to have an echo, and I'm looking at, the, obviously, the size of the heart, wall motion abnormalities, atrial size, valve lesions. I'm looking for any signs of pre-acceleration, particularly for flutter, that's Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Um, is it flutter? It's missed by a lot of people, and actually flutter, you just don't manage with drugs. That is where you send the patient for an ablation. Um, you might do a cardio version on the way, but you want them to have an ablation. And I want to know, what is the burden of AF? Because unless they've got five minutes of AF in a seven-day period, I might not even treat it, you know, particularly if they're low risk overall. So I want to modify any of the risk factors if I can. Um, talk about them in, in a half an hour session for a new AF patient. It's difficult to talk about all of them, but we try to uh, talk about the drugs if they've got you know, a significant amount of rhythm disturbance. Yes, they should be anticoagulated, but even anticoagulation now is being personal. You know, you've got all the NOACs now, and you want to decide, have they had a GI bleed? Are they at risk of it? Have they had a stroke? Who's had an infarct? So you tailor which NOAC you choose. Um, it's, you know, it is becoming more personal. So let's talk about case three. This was a 37-year-old lady I saw on the coronary care probably about four years ago. Um, she's now, well, yeah, she's the mother of four-year-old twins. She was pregnant when I saw her. Uh, she came across from the MAT unit with fast AF, 
I wanted to cardiovert this lady. Uh, you would not believe the kerfuffle that we had because the anaesthetists weren't happy to cardiovert her. Um, the the, um, the paediatricians said that she would, if she had a cardioversion, she would deliver the babies instantly and they didn't have any neonatal beds. And so this poor woman went round and round in circles, which I'm sure lots of people would identify with that type of problem. Um, in the end, you know, we just kept to the chase and... Uh, tried some IV flecomide, it didn't work, so we cardioverted her, absolutely no problem at all. She was well for the rest of her pregnancy. And I saw her at about eight weeks for a follow-up, she was absolutely fine. So she suddenly came back four years later, and she was, comp she, I mean, she basically came in and said, I want an ablation, I want an AF ablation. And I was like, hey, let's just like, let's find out a little bit more. And she was very, very stressed and hyper when she came in. Uh, so going through the story, she was having short bursts of irregular heartbeat, a jogging in at night time. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, she was terrified in case her AF came back. She um, wasn't on any medication. She didn't want any more. Um, so what did I do with her? Same sort of thing, basically. Um, took the history. She was working... Um, long hours and she was finding it quite stressful. She was drinking half a bottle of wine while she was cooking dinner. She was eating really late. Uh, then she started running on top of all of this. And so we just sat down, talked it through and she came back once more. She'd cut back a bit on the alcohol. She'd sort of started going to classes earlier in the evening and her symptoms had disappeared. And once she knew that she didn't have AF you know, anymore, she was absolutely fine. So I'm going to speed through the other ones. Um, this one is a lady who was a 57 year old teacher. She was complaining of palpitations and chest discomfort, had it for months, uh, shot to breath on exertion. I couldn't see why this lady had this problem. There was nothing obvious at all. I couldn't find anything on examination, but certainly on her 24 hour EC, uh, ECG, which she came to the clinic with, her AF was like going like crazy, 170 beats per minute. Um, her echo showed big atria. She was given beta blockers as the first treatment. She was actually seen by one of my GPSIs, who's very, very au fait with treatment, but she, as most people do, gave her beta blockers. And this woman came in about 24 hours later in the emergency department with chest pain, systolic of 80, and an elevated troponin, and new anterior T-wave changes on her ECG. And she went off and had an angiogram, and it was normal. And then she had a cardiac MRI, and it showed a small infarct. Has anybody know the cause of her infarct. No, it was a thromboembolic event that she sort of had. She was, um, she was only on aspirin because she was like Chad's Fask 1, technically. Um, and so she was put on aspirin, obviously, after her infarct, but things... I'll, I'll move on a bit with that. Anyway, you can ask me questions later. So she was really struggling with this diagnosis. Um, she then, after a month, she went on from the aspirin onto a NOAC, and she was reviewed in clinic. Uh, and she, as I was picking up her hands, I thought, mm, what's that ring? So I sort of said, oh, I like that ring. <laughs> Where did you get that from? And her husband shouted, it's her snoring ring. I was like, what? And she said, oh, she snores like an Irish navvy. And obviously she was really embarrassed about that, but it turned out that this woman had a really big problem with obstructive sleep apnea. And so she's now, um, you know, that's been confirmed, she's on CPAP, and actually she's happy on her medication, she's back at work. Um, you know, we haven't had to go down the ablation route with her. Um, next guy, 53-year-old painter and decorator, playing with a fast heart rate a lot of the time. He's had symptoms for 20 years. They were recently worth, worth he had a poor exercise tolerance. Um, he, it actually was referred to me in 2002, but I sort of didn't see him. And they, they thought that they maybe they saw a PE and they put him on anticoagulation. So he was anticoagulated when I saw him. Um, he couldn't work full time. He had recent divorce. He had both of his sons, adult sons, living with him, and one had been under Great Ormond Street for unexplained symptoms for years, and his other son was queried bipolar. And when he was well, he liked to climb. So his ECG was right bundle branch block, wasn't really too abnormal. He'd had loads of sort of tests done, which were all said to be normal, and his blood tests were normal. But when I examined him, he had really hypermobile fingers, uh, feet and ankles. He had an increase in his heart rate on standing, and his blood pressure actually went up a bit on standing. That's sort of how his big toes were. And so I went right back through his old notes, and he had these really long periods of sinus tachycardia. 
Uh, and when he did have an exercise test, his blood pressure hardly went up at, at all. So summarising with him, he'd been thought it was, it was due to anxiety and inhalers, but he had a very poor f um, food and fluid intake. And we did a tilt table test on him and he had postural orthostatic tachycardia. And he's being managed with food and fluid and Q10 for fatigue, which I use a lot of with my patients. And I'm now seeing his son as a patient because it's autosomal dominant. Um, I think I might skip this one. That was a lady who was a pharmacist, and I managed to wean her from beta blockers onto evapidine with rescue remedy. Um, and I'll just do my last one. A 52-year-old teacher, she saw the GP with menopausal symptoms. She had a heart rate of 50, she was struggling to play tennis, she had mild fatigue, occasional dizziness, she hadn't blacked out. Couldn't find anything apart from she was a bit underweight, checked her lying and standing um, heart rate and blood pressure, bloods were all normal. Her ECG showed quite a marked sign of bradycardia and I thought, mm, what am I going to do? I didn't feel happy about this lady having a pacemaker, although technically some people might have done that. So I went back through the history and said, well, have you changed your diet and stuff? And she said, well, yeah, when I hit you know, the menopause, I started to put on a bit of weight and I cut out chocolate and coffee, which I used to you know, have loads of. And um, it really all sort of started after that. So we decided to do an experiment and put her on like four espressos in the morning uh, and she could go back to eating chocolate. And then she was actually on her 24-hour ECGs, which we did, her heart rate went up by 10 to 15 beats per minute and she was coping fine and she did an exercise test and although it is slightly blunted her heart rate response she can do all the things she wants to do and she certainly doesn't need a pacemaker so i'm going to summarize you put her back, yeah. on yeah. back on coffee and chocolate yeah <laughs> yeah so so summarizing take and retake the history think a bit laterally go through the old investigations take a food diary look for hypermobility can't stress that enough um, think of other options to, to the antiarrhythmic drugs patients really don't want to be on them and that includes beta blockers i think sometimes just doing nothing reassuring and just listening is really powerful um, as treatment as anything else and make it personal so sorry it's a bit of a whittle stop tour thank you, thank you. Thank you.